recovering from one pandemic and preparing the next. During the next 25 minutes, we will have the pleasure to listen to three really important speakers. Firstly, Dr. Alison Fox Robinson from Canada. She will speak about the Canada, Canada, Canadian experience with COVID-19 patients. Then, Dr. Supraregi from Brazil will speak about heart lung interaction interaction during mechanical ventilation in COVID-19 patients. And finally, and finally, despite Dr. Jorge Hidalgo is not present right now, he sent the record of his lecture entitled Building on what we have learned. At the end of these three sections, three lectures, we, we will have five to, te, to ten minutes for questions. Please feel free to leave all your questions at the chat. Thank you very much. And Dr. Afol Fox, the floor is yours. Thank you. You know, the sixth edition of this World Day of the Critical Lung, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we have has happened to us in Canada some of the impact, the lessons and the preparation that we have done before and what we can do to keep going through this pandemic. Um, in Canada, as part of the truth and reconciliation process with our Indigenous and First Nations peoples, speakers acknowledge that we are settlers on the land of peoples who came before us. The city of Hamilton and McMaster University from where I speak stands on the protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. This land, which was the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Wampum belts are beads bound into strings which narrate Haudenosaunee history, tradition, and laws. The dish with one spoon wampum was created to bind the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to the great law of peace. The dish represented the shared land, while one spoon reinforces the idea of sharing and peace. For many thousands of years, the first people sought to walk gently on this land, offered their assistance to the first European travelers, and shared their knowledge for survival in what was at times a harsh climate. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based in honor and deep respect. May we be guided by our love and right, as we trans right action as we transform our personal and institutional relationships with our Indigenous friends and neighbors. I have a couple of conflicts to declare. I have received funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to support Sepsis Canada, which is our national research network. And speaking about pandemic, that's important. And I am the current president of the Canadian Sepsis Foundation, a not-for-profit corporation that supports sepsis awareness and advocacy. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I hope to provide you with an overview of the Canadian healthcare system, the pandemic impact nationally and provincially, and discuss some of the lessons we've learned around patient care and the impact on critical care during and after the pandemic. For those of you who haven't visited the cold north of Canada, um, Canadian facts, we're the second largest country in area, but one of the most sparsely populated, except in the most southern area, if you look on this map down in this region, our population is only about 37 million across that large expanse of land. We are a constitutional monarchy, but with an independent federal and provincial governments. And our health care, importantly, both acute and primary care, is available to all Canadian citizens, landed immigrants and refugees in a socially funded system since the mid-1960s. We will not turn anyone away from our hospital, irrespective of their ability to pay or not. This is an overview of the, how the pandemic affected us in Canada from our national database of population health. Um, I've just highlighted in the green arrow. So the upper graph here are the reported cases, and you can see all of those waves going across. The arrow is when the um, vaccines were first introduced primarily into our long care, for care facilities and into our healthcare workers originally. It was this, um, I would say, if you add it on two, three, four, fifth wave, um, that Delta wave that probably hit us the worst. Um, the data around vaccinations clearly shows what many of us know around the world, that vaccinations prevented particularly deaths 
um, but also hospitalizations. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit later about the number of Canadians that have actually been vaccinated. Um, we have seen an initial uptake, but maybe not broadly as we would like. Um, we had updates. This data that you see in these maps are the most recent data, but we could have this data coming from the government on a daily basis. Um, it shows the large distribution of both the count, total count cases and the deaths across the across Canada. Um, of particular note, for the long, longest time, um, our Northern Territories were relatively well protected, particularly through lockdown. And I must say that, you know, Nunavut, which is our big sort of Northern Territory, is relatively isolated and those communities protected themselves really quite well. Um, that is in huge contrast to the most populous areas of the country. Um, this is my province, Ontario. This is Quebec beside me and um, our colleagues in Alberta, which seem to have a, a much higher caseload and corresponding um, increased number of deaths across the country. I think where Canada really failed is um, probably our elderly um, we have a healthcare system that are many of our elderly and most vulnerable are pace, placed in institutionalized systems. And unlike the preparation that was done in many um, acute care facilities, the long-term care facilities did not have access to personal protective equipment, um, were not prepared to isolate and support their elderly, had short staff. And we had, as a result, a large death rate in our elderly very early on in the pandemic. Um, it, it, it peaked again during the Delta. And once we were able to get vaccines and more recently, those rates have gone down. But uh, it has been probably our, our biggest um, regret um, that was certainly in the media about the lack of protection of the elderly. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk specifically about the critical care supports. Um, I'm fortunate to live in one of our provinces across the country in which um, the SARS pandemic, that initial COVID virus, um, was um, heavily influenced, particularly in the Toronto area in 2005. As a result of all of that, there was a strategic plan across the province to develop critical care services, and this is called Critical Care Services Ontario. There were a number of strategies that came out of that, the most important of which was a critical care information system that allows us to track the number of patients admitted not only to intensive care units, but also to high acuity or step down units on a twice daily basis. This data also includes what organ support we are providing at any one moment to those patients. And that information system was extremely valuable. We also have a centrally funded, so government funded rapid response system in our largest hospitals that reports data into that. There's a leadership structure that allows rapid communication across the entire province um, and a governance structure that tells us what to do linked back into the Ministry of Health. A centralized communication platform um, in which it's a one phone call number if we have to move critically ill patients around the country, including those or the province particularly, including those patients who um, a small community or rural hospital may deem to have a life and limb condition that requires transfer to an academic center. Um, all of this is linked through a provincial wide government funded um, patient critical patient transfer system called Orange. And I give you the references for the websites out there if you were interested in learning more. So one of the things that um, the Critical Care um, Services Ontario had was post the 2005 SARS pandemic, SARS-1 pandemic, is that we had built a ventilator stockpile. It had more than 200. It was stored across the province. And, and that actually did become useful. Many of those were transport ventilators, older ventilators. We had done some updating as we moved old ventilators uh, out of service and brought in new stock. We kept some of those in that ventilator stockpile. And so that allowed us to have the ventilator capacity to vent patients that we needed to. Also in place were provincial and regional reporting systems that um, helped during those peak 
periods in um, something that we called load balancing, which maybe um, audience may not know about, where patients were moved across the province based on their acuity and see some images of us moving critical care patients across. We had what looked like city buses turned into these massive ambulances that we could move more than one patient, but we also moved non-critically ill patients um, to load level as well. Over the peak of the pandemic, we moved 25, more than 2,500 patients transferred within the province. And when neighboring provinces and even Midwest provinces were in overcapacity, we actually received patients from Manitoba and Saskatchewan, a distance of more than a thousand kilometers to bring those patients to without their families and all of the other things. So that was a bit of a challenge. Matched with this were a number of resources for training, redeployed staff and physicians um, to provide care. You know, like many of us, we had to shut down our operating rooms. And so anesthesiologists and surgeons were back into the ICU where many of them would never have experienced since their residency training. Um, and we gave them the necessary skills to be able to help. At the same time, we had a number of redeploying nursing staff from wards, operating rooms and other areas to be able to support that. And we increased our critical care capacity at all of the major sites from a normal that runs somewhere around 100 to 105 percent, we're over capacity, not uncommonly, up to 120 percent capacity um, with the addition of adding uh, unconventional critical care bed spaces. I spent some time in our, our heart investigation unit running a chronic ICU for a um, couple of weeks. Um, it's not to say that we don't have ongoing challenges in Canada. Um, here's some, some few headlines and papers. I want to draw your attention that if you look at G7 countries around the world, Canada is amongst the poorest number for the number of hospital beds per thousand people. Um, and it, this shows our current vaccination status. So while there was initial uptake, we haven't had the same uptake for the boosters. Um, particularly, I think there's a generation that forgets the previous pandemics. I'm old enough to remember polio, and I'm certainly old enough to remember measles outbreaks. And I think, unfortunately, the um, anti-vax movement in Canada is quite strong. Um, we certainly provided extra corporeal life support in my hospital, particularly we had only just started to get a, a VA ECMO up and running. We pivoted quickly to a VV system. Um, and at our peak, we were had at least eight patients on ECMO. We were one of four centers in the province able to provide that support. Um, and um, in addition to that, you know, we had a, a steep learning curve in terms of getting the education. We had fortunate that we had a couple of young trainees who had trained and the peaks in Toronto, I think they had at least 20 to 25 patients on ECMO at any one time. And that was probably the largest capacity. But the out fallout from all of this has been the loss of our staff. Um, we have ongoing problems in terms of IPU nursing staff shortages. I think um, many of our critical care nurses have both had moral distress and just plain burnout and have walked out of the ICU onto other jobs and other areas or, or retired early. Um, we're still experiencing sh staff shortages across. And now in Canada, we're being hit with a pediatric wave of COVID plus influenza plus RSV that's overwhelming our pediatric ICUs and hospital capacity at this time. Um, this chart just highlights the fact that it's not just the healthcare industry that um, has a shortage of labor and expected to have it by industry. But I think every industry across our country has been hit by labor shortages. The good news is that our prime minister has announced that we will be taking anybody that wants to move to Canada over the next year. So we're supporting um, a, a large um, plan for immigration as we've done in the past. Um, despite all of these challenges, our community had an opportunity to study many of the issues that were important in critical care, and I've highlighted a few of the papers. 
Um, our nurses spent time um, studying um, what was important to them, highlighting some of these papers about family presence in the ICU, um, the effect of mental health on the nursing staff, um, physician perceptions of how we were coping, particularly with the first wave of the pandemic, knowing it, not knowing at that time that it was going to get worse. Um, and consensus statements in terms of visitation policies. Like many of us, we shut our families out for the most part and, and didn't bring them back even through that fifth wave when things were bad. And that has had an overwhelming impact on the families. Um, I could also highlight the fact that Canada was intimately involved in, in both the guidelines from the SCCM from an evidence-based approach and that we ran remap cap in many of our hospitals, uh, in addition to a number of small studies through the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group. So um, the research continued despite the strain in our ICUs. So in conclusion, compared to other G7 countries, I would say Canada has fared relatively well, and certainly compared to our neighbours to the south in the U.S., um, and despite our vast geography and resource limitations, we've attempted to provide equitable care in most regions. I will say that the ongoing political situation in many of our provinces and infrastructure has placed challenges not only on our elderly, but our ability to continue to maintain what is a often held laudable social health care system for all Canadians. Critical care resources were stretched, but readiness plans that we had from prior pandemics provided a framework for many of us. And our Canadian critical care teams and researchers made significant contributions to understanding treatments, gaps in care, and the stressors that we had on our system. And with that, I will stop. Dr. Fox, thank you very much for your lecture. Dr. Fernando Suparegui, it's your floor. Please share your screen and go ahead. Thank you very much. I would like uh, to thank you for this invitation to present uh, this uh, very important issue. In, in critical ill patients, uh, the heart lung interactions and mainly in patients with COVID during the pandemics. I have no uh, conflict interest to declare. And my talk, uh, I will focus how positive pressure affects the heart, uh, heart-lung interactions in ARDS, how to monitor uh, the heart function during mechanical ventilation, and what we can do to improve heart-lung interactions in these patients. And I, I think that this picture from 1953 uh, is very uh, important in the critical ill management patients needing mechanical ventilation. I, I confess, I think that very few interventions could reduce mortality more than 80% to less than 40% in uh, uh, six months uh, after the introduction of uh, mechanical ventilation with uh, positive pressure during the polio uh, pandemics in Denmark and in Scandinavian uh, countries. Uh, nowadays, we know that this very important uh, intervention affects the heart, uh, augmenting uh, the right ventricle after all, and influencing, by uh, instance, uh, the uh, relationship between right and left ventricle. So, we can, uh, we need uh, really to manage patients uh, with the proposal uh, to improve uh, oxygenation and maintain uh, blood flow uh, because in these uh, situations, uh, we fight against uh, atelectasis and the overdistension provoked by the in increase in, in lung volume. Uh, in the left, we can see uh, that in pa that patients with atelectasis, there is a reduction in lung volumes. In this, uh, increase uh, the hypo hypoxia vasoconstriction response, so uh, increasing after all of the, of the right ventricle by one mechanism. On the other hand, at right, if we increase the lung volume, we 
uh, provoke over distension and this of course reduces uh, the performance of the right length the, the right ventricle in other view we can uh, we can uh, say that the recruitment maneuvers should uh, should uh, reduce uh, the hypoxy uh, vasoconstriction and not un not load uh, in excess the right ventricle. On the other hand, the overinflation it's a U shape as you can see. Uh, the the ideal is that we maintain our patients in the basis of the curve. Uh, avoiding increase the pulmonary uh, vascular resistance by one side and on the other side increase the lung stress by increase the lung volume. This is a pivotal study uh, by Ashbaugh and Dr. Petty published in 1967 and you can see that the, for the first time uh, in 12 patients submitted to mechanical ventilation for treating the ARDS, uh, the use of positive and respiratory pressure was helpful to combating <clears throat> even atelectasis and hypoxemia. Uh, almost 10 years later, uh, Dr. Sutter showed that, the, that to uh, find out the best level of PIP is not easy in the clinical practice. And uh, they proposed that in these patients with uh, less resources to monitoring the cardiovascular and, and lung function at that days, that we could uh, use the compliance to uh, estimate the optimum PIP in these patients. So even uh, 50 years ahead, we are still looking for which is the best value to setting PIP in patients with ARDS. And recently, Dr. Gattinoni and Dr. Marini uh, published uh, this uh, article, this study, this conference, comparing that the search for uh, the best people maybe uh, is like in the search of the Holy Grail. So it's very difficult to establish which is the best people for an individual patient. We know that above a peak of five centimeters of water increase pulmonary vascular resistance. And, and after uh, other studies uh, comparing uh, the levels of PIP above five, uh, like this study by Dr. Jardin showed that uh, our um, reduction in end diastolic and systolic volume in the left uh, ventricle. And interesting, in very curious, despite this study uh, has more than 40 years, that in patients with PIP levels above uh, 10 uh, centimeters of water, uh, the right atrial pressure could be more confident than the pulmonary capillary pressure to uh, indicate uh, the relationship between uh, left ventricle and diastolic pressure and pressure to establish the preload uh, between ventricles. Along this, uh, the we peep above five centimeters, there is a reduction in right ventricle ejection fraction, showing that in these patients, the elevation of PIP uh, is not uh, is not without uh, compromising of the uh, cardiac performance. When we put in a in balance the benefits of PIP, we should uh, establish if the uh, the level of PIP we offer to a patient reduce uh, cardiac output or help to maintain cardiac output. Uh, uh, guaranteeing uh, the flow to perfusion uh, all organs of the, uh, the body. In, in patients with ARDS during COVID, 
Uh, one problem and more important at the first times of COVID pandemics was determina determination of the need to endotracheal intubation in these patients. So many times uh, this difficult in the uh, decision making uh, led to patients to uh, present a closed loop uh, alteration, uh, the value vortex. Uh, that uh, by the vigorous effort by the patients, uh, inducing the valley, uh, increase in pulmonary edema, so uh, aggravating hypoxemia, and this delay uh, causing uh, many difficulties in the management, in the ventilatory management of the patients after them. Some proposals. Uh, extrapolate the levels that we accept uh, to ventilate safely uh, our patients. Uh, as you can see, uh, the plateau pressure, uh, of course, less than 30 centimeters of water, but uh, I will show you um, in the next few slides that uh, some uh, strategies to ventilate patients uh, thinking of the work uh, need for uh, the right ventricle, maybe this pressure uh, should be less than uh, 30 centimeters. And the level of PIP uh, set it in these patients, of course, uh, there is a great variability uh, according to the uh, response. Uh, and in this case, for sure, we uh, should uh, establish the level of people, the driving pressure, the plateau pressure, uh, the level of uh, FiO2 to guarantee the oxygenation in these patients. It's not easy task, it's, a, it's not easy a task the, to establish how to correct hypoxia uh, and without uh, harming the cardiac output, the cardiac performance. In this picture, Above, we can see the measures uh, that improve oxygenation, ventilation, and in, in the low part, uh, the measures that uh, improve cardiac performance. Uh, you can see that measures that benefit uh, the cardiac output, the cardiac performance, uh, invariably, uh, they uh, cause harm to the lungs, uh, mainly increasing the uh, extravascular lung water. So applying PIP, uh, we can uh, improve the shunt, uh, but we reduce cardiac out output, mainly if after uh, 10 centimeters of water. So is, uh, in this case, we need uh, to have a close monitoring of these patients from the hemodynamics and the blood gas changes. In the patients, it's common uh, to develop um, a, a acute core pulmonal. So uh, the risk factors in this situation is pati are patients that uh, for risk uh, uh, as pneumonia as the cause of ARDS, uh, an accentuated grade of uh, hypoxemia, uh, hypercarbia, and a driving pressure above 80 centimeters of water. It's not easy to establish one uh, only factor to uh, attribute the high ventricle dysfunction. There is a lot of uh, factors that can affect the right ventricle uh, performance, including ischemia, arrhythmias, pulmonary uh, thromboembolism, and left ventricle dysfunction. Uh, echocardiography is very useful in these uh, situations. We can detect the right ventricular dysfunction, uh, dislodgement of the uh, uh, interventricular septum uh, to the left, and the reduction of the left ventricle cavity in patients with uh, right ventricle dysfunction in ARDS. Uh, this picture shows that there, there is a dislodgement of the uh, interventricular septum, uh, we can have uh, a reduction in uh, coronary perfusion, an increase in oxygen demand, and an imbalance in oxygen supply demand. 
to monitor in these patients, we can use the PA catheter, we can use uh, echocardiography, and we can use uh, transpulmonary uh, thermodilution for uh, establish uh, the relationship and what level uh, the cardiac uh, perf uh, function is compromising in these patients. The pulmonary artery catheter, despite uh, some studies, uh, show that they, uh, they, they their use don't decrease mortality. We know that a uh, uh, tool for monitoring uh, by uh, per se, it's impossible to reduce mortality. Uh, one advantage of the pulmonary artery catheter is that if you monitor in continuously the cardiac output, uh, we can also uh, monitoring uh, SVO2 uh, and right ventricular and diastolic uh, volume and uh, ejection fraction. In this case, you can see that there is a, a great loop on the right ventricle showing that this patient uh, presents with right ventricular dysfunction. Uh, echocardiography is very useful, and we can establish a, a diagnosis and another factors that can be present in these patients, uh, like a cardiogenic component, a hypovolemic, the presence of a pulmonary embolism that was uh, frequently in COVID patients, and another uh, alterations, including uh, atelectasis and pneumothorax. The management of fluids is very important in ARDS patients, so we pay at, must pay attention for the level of the uh, the level of the pulmonary edema uh, provoked by the high pressures in heart failure, it's only above uh, 25 millimeters of uh, mercury. So in ARDS, uh, this level from 25 uh, is only to uh, 12 uh, centimeters of uh, millimeters of uh, mercury. So. Uh, in these patients, we uh, need a restrictive uh, fluid management. And one important uh, utility of the heart-lung uh, interaction is to avail uh, fluid responsiveness. Uh, we have a family of curves, uh, including patients with poor ventricular function and patients with normal uh, ventricular function. After uh, a challenge uh, fluid, we can establish if the patient is responsible or not. And this is provoked by the impact of mechanical ventilation uh, using uh, tidal volume between eight and 10 uh, ml per kilo. Uh, this is a, a personal concern that we create an artificial uh, situation to avoid, uh, to, uh, monitoring the need for uh, fluid uh, in these patients, and then we return to ventilators patients between four and six ml per kilo. So uh, I think that we can use uh, in these patients, uh, considering the severity of the illness, uh, cautiously. We need uh, more uh, specific uh, monitoring in this situation. Uh, here we have uh, one picture showing the variation in delta uh, in systolic pressure volume uh, and showing the delta up and delta down uh, with use of this monitoring tool. And finally, uh, to improve the heart lung interactions, we need to uh, uh, use a right ventricle protective ventilation, reduce the right ventricle after all. Uh, prone position and avoid uh, positive fluid balance. Uh, the proposal of a uh, right ventricle protective ventilation uh, consists in improved oxygenation uh, using uh, a strategy uh, with a plateau pressure uh, less than 20, uh, 27, a driving pressure less than 80, uh, 18 centimeters of water, uh, use prone position and avoid hypercapnia, uh, maintaining uh, PCO2 less than 48. So uh, in extremely cases, we, we can use uh, extracorporeal removal of CO2. 
Uh, in this study by Jardin, uh, the level of plateau pressure uh, show that uh, if we increase the level of plateau pressure, uh, there is a, a correlation between mortality in these patients. Uh, drugs like uh, nitric oxide can improve uh, the uh, function of the uh, right ventricle, reducing the afterload by a selective uh, vasodilation uh, and not increasing the uh, risk of uh, the, the, pulmon uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance by a non-selective uh, vasodilation in pulmonary circulation. Uh, in this report by Mebaza, you can see that after stopping the nitric uh, oxide inhalation, there is an increase in pulmonary artery pressure and uh, tricuspid regurgitation with v, uh, giant V waves uh, with a reduction in cardiac output and then uh, returning the o nitric oxide, uh, the hemodynamic status uh, returned to uh, level before the the suspended of the nitric oxide. In prone position, mainly by uh, eliminating the compression of the heart and redirection, the pressures to small areas of the ventral regions uh, allows that uh, these regions uh, could uh, ventilate it with lower pressures and the need of low levels of a PIP to maintain the recruited areas. And finally, but not less important, the a conservative fluid management uh, is associated with survival in these patients. So, uh, in concluding, uh, we need to uh, establish the uh, heart-lung interaction in these patients, in the critical ill patient, to improve the DO2, the, uh, considering that uh, one side we have cardiac output, in the, in the other side, the arterial content of oxygen. So the heart, the lung, and the uh, uh, minimum level of hemoglobin is important. And when you manage patients uh, with cardiovascular dysfunction in this setting, we need to uh, be aware with the level of fluids, infusion, use of vasopressor, hynotropics, and extracorporal support. Uh, in the case of uh, lungs, we must uh, ventilate these patients with a low tidal volume. Uh, it's very difficult to establish the best PIP. Uh, I think that in this case, we still need to individualize which is the best PIP, considering uh, a safe uh, level of plateau and driving pressure in these patients. And at least uh, maintain a minimum level of hemoglobin to guarantee uh, the oxygen delivery. Uh, considering that heart and lung uh, must uh, work together for the critical ill, uh, it's important that uh, do, we do not uh, have uh, an antagonic uh, effect of, of uh, between these organs. And the most important is that uh, they do not each other, they, they do not hurt each other, do not harm each other, because uh, it's very important, uh, the equilibrium in the critical ill, uh, considering lung and heart interactions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Supraregi. Well, the third session, the third lecture of this session will be delivered by Dr. Jorge Hidalgo. I mean, in saying that, we will start uh, sharing some thoughts on COVID-19. First of all, I want to share my conflict of interest. Uh, we are the authors of COVID-19 pandemic lessons from the front line, along with Dr. Gloria Rodriguez and Dr. Javier Perez Fernandez. And of course, this is a time to reflect on what happened in the last two years concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a kaleidoscope, uh, we can say, and we can imagine the coronavirus uh, at the beginning and what happened with the coronavirus mutations through this couple of years. Of course, this virus is not the same like uh, we have uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. 
and let's take a look. Of course, during, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, all of us as a leader, we were lost, we were confused, unsure. We have un, un, also uh, unclear about how uh, to face such a, 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 a new disease. Is essentially like a game between death and life. And we uh, encountered this serial killer, you know? COVID-19 essentially behaved like a serial killer uh, as a systemic and complex disease. We uh, see the patients behaving like an ERDH, but however, COVID-19, it not a, a traditional ERDH. We see some pneumonia uh, with some areas of pneumolysis. Also, uh, we uh, see some changes and problems with the coagulation and thrombosis and hemorrhage. And, and of course, we see some uh, problems uh, as uh, the end with changes with fibrosis, especially some of the patients that have long COVID that still uh, dealing with pulmonary fibrosis. In that, essentially, we see a condition that uh, came and caused a sabotage in our immune system. The arsenal of this virus uh, and her versatility uh, to uh, uh, move and to also to uh, attack our immune system was definitely incredible. Some of the uh, sabotaging are basically as a responsible for different elements that I'm showing in the picture. Uh, but of course, it uh, was uh, something new, uh, very difficult for us at the very beginning. Now, of course, our understanding and our knowledge about the condition has been uh, improved. And then uh, we have more information and more knowledgeable as how to deal with that. And with that, COVID-19, it was only a respiratory virus, as we mentioned before, but we were wrong uh, about it. And we see that the COVID-19, it can affect from head to toes. We see problems with the brain. We see problems with the heart. We see problems with the kidneys. We see a multi-systemic condition, uh, simple things like loss and, uh, and as, as smell and, and taste at the beginning, uh, the respiratory problems, gastrointestinal problems, and also skin manifestations that are essentially particular for COVID. And the other thing is, uh, of course, we need to, to recognize some of the defining photos of the pandemia and the different stories behind them. And as we see in the picture, this is a picture that we got from John Moore from CNN. Uh, as this uh, healthcare work is trying to save the life of this uh, elderly patient. And as we can see in the table, uh, 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 all the, the poly medicine and different type of medication that this, they have as a family and of course the creativity that uh, also uh, as, as a parents we have as we can see in this um, uh, faces face protection made by bottles for these Chinese parents trying to protect the kids uh, trying to also leave China uh, and going to uh, some some moving to other areas uh, looking for safety. But definitely we need to learn from our past and look at look back and see what things we did and also uh, how those things can be useful in our preparation for a new pandemic. And we need to review the some of the ancient outbreaks and trying to see how we can learn from those stories. It's important to know that as well, despite that the viruses are uh, bad and, and, and create 
all these different effects. Also, we need to uh, recognize that virus plays an important role in the evolu evolution of uh, the cells, especially uh, in terms of the proteins. And uh, those are critical. You know? and we need to, we need to uh, recognize that part of, of the viruses that it uh, over, over the years has been uh, an important player in the evolution of the cells. Definitely the, the historic of the pandemic, as we can uh, say that some of the um, uh, countries affected for the pandemic also uh, in a way contribute to the downfall of this powerful civilization. And some of the examples are the plague of eight Athens, uh, the Antonine plague, and the plague of Justinian. As we can see uh, in, in the, the plague of Athens uh, during the Peloponnesian War, and we see how uh, this um, pl play an important role uh, during these uh, ages. We see the description of uh, the disease at that point with fever, uh, hemorrhage. However, uh, we don't know exactly what caused. Some theories say that probably could be uh, some hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, but is essentially some of the possibilities. During the Antonin plague, we have also uh, as a, a description, the description of Galen, one of the doctors of uh, at that point, uh, a Greek doctor who essentially did a description and described a picture similar like the smallpox, uh, or probably a typhoid fever. No? Uh, and also we have the, the Justinian plague. Uh, in any of these three descriptions plays an important role, the trade and the, uh, of goods that happen and people traveling from one country to another and also the downfall of these three important uh, civilizations. Uh, coming to our um, side in America, we see the epidemic of Cocolistli in Mexico that also uh, played an important role uh, and uh, also caused an important death toll. And in those uh, particular cases that like we see is um, people getting sick and due to the exposure to uh, that now we know is a typhoid fever con a medical condition that uh, was new for the people uh, uh, in that age and of course uh, it has an important um, uh, cause of, of mortality for this group. We have also the, the Great Plague of Mar Marseille. And as a description, we have uh, in the port, uh, the Grand uh, San Antonin ship arriving to uh, Marseille at the port, but uh, knowing that uh, probably they have some people sick, they uh, managed to only have a quarantine for a day or two since uh, that the owner of the San Antonin was connected with the, at that point, mayor of the city. Uh, after a, a, a day or two, they authorized him to disembark and bring the goods uh, to the city. And with the goods also came rats and also the bubonic plague. Uh, we have also the description of uh, the yellow fever epidemia in Philadelphia. Uh, uh, that also uh, cast an important uh, morbidity and mortality and force George Washington to move from uh, that city at that point. Uh, just um, years after they discovered that was uh, a yellow fever. I want to mention the third cholera outbreak that probably was the one that caused the major uh, mortality. In any circumstances, always the trade and always uh, traveling and the exposure to new germs cars uh, play an, an important role uh, and the, the preparation that we must have. 
And again, some of the defining pictures of the pandemic, we see how uh, or at, that, at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought that probably this one was a condition that only affects elderly. And we isolate the elderly population as the most vulnerable at that point. Uh, and of course, most of us after uh, an hours of work uh, in our vehicles, we hand over mask in, in the rear window. Uh, we need to also mention the Black Death, not the bubonic pl plague, and how this essentially has an important uh, mortality in in Europe and basically have, have a, some terrifying stories about about that. And that's, but as you can see, this picture I want to rely on what happened uh, in in those days. You no, know, mean that there are not too much difference to see people in the streets dying because of the at that point the bubonic plaque and now for COVID nineteen. Uh, this also is a picture from the uh, journalist Alessio Paduano in Italy that he accompanied the ambulances. And as we can see, also uh, accompany the health workers in different moments of the, uh, in the ambulance, in the ICU. And also we can see right here, uh, two uh, parents bury his uh, son. No? Um, as we know, the play had claimed an estimate of 40 to 50 percent of the uh, European population at that point. And most of the time, the funerals uh, during the Black Day tend to occur during the night just to avoid a, a congregation of people. And similar that in those days, as you can see right here, two faces in this uh, glass trying to look for the low ones uh, in the morgue. And Lazaretto Island was uh, the first uh, uh, area of quarantine, the description of quarantine during the uh, bubonic plague that affects Venice and they utilize Lazaretto Island as an area of quarantine. And of course, the attire, the special attire of the doctors on, on, on that time, not too much different to our attires in during the uh, beginning of the pandemic. And right here we can see uh, during the bubonic plague in London, how they marked with red the uh, houses that were affected and also they put fire in the uh, outside of the houses trying to, to prevent to get contaminated. And the attire of the plague doctor where if they were had, they are they are the considered the doctors in the in the peak. They essentially put some different essence to trying to uh, prevent to get uh, contaminated, uh, special attire and a special stick to uh, avoid contact to the patients. I mean that and that uh, put us to our defining pictures of uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic where we're trying to create. Uh, some protective equipment that since uh, the at the beginning of the pandemic was uh, essentially uh, a scar or very difficult to get a protective equipment. And the influence, of course, and again, another defining picture of the pandemic with this mother trying to make a, a, a special protection for her and, and her baby and to be able to go outside. And then, of course, COVID-19 came and changed of the world, our world with uh, global effects in, in economy and many other areas of our life. We know how our global health institution reach uh, their limits, uh, even those countries that we thought they have an, a very strong um, health systems uh, they get into trouble during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As we can see right here in this picture, uh, one uh, health worker essentially uh, very tired and with a lot of frustration due to the pandemic. Uh, 
one of the things that definitely this um, COVID-19 prove is that the individualism is a myth and the humans evolve to be inter interdependent and not, not self-sufficient. I mean that um, one of the important things that uh, help us to move forward is the collaboration, the way how everybody interact and, and, and also contribute to be a Another important aspect that uh, it came with the pandemia was the, the inequality got much, uh, much worse. You know? And one of the things is access to vaccines. As we know, uh, some of the low income countries essentially was waiting for, for the assigned uh, quote of vaccines at the beginning. You know? Uh, and of course, that uh, it shows the fragility of uh, some of the economies and some of the the countries, especially uh, in terms of uh, trying to get equipment, trying to get uh, personal protection, uh, as many other things that also uh, the health workers were uh, needed at that point. The other important aspect that we need to also stress was the uh, play of the social media storm no? that we call it. Um, and basically what we see is uh, a lot of uh, that also call it infotemia, where we have many, many uh, uh, information and disinformation uh, going on and also trying to mislead the scientific work. No, I mean that the, the social media play an important role uh, during the evolution of the uh, pandemia uh, in some points was very useful, but in some others also was misleading for many uh, people. No? This one again is during the quarantine and we see these mountain gods uh, walking in these quiet streets in uh, Wales in March 2020. Uh, when also some of the restrictions start to uh, basically um, came out, then also some people went out in Toronto uh, in these uh, plastic covers to prevent to get contaminated and trying to keep social distancing. And we have also some of the patients, especially this patient Francisco España, uh, who was recovering from the coronavirus and looks uh, at the Mediterranean Sea from a promenade in Barcelona, Spain in September 2000. Uh, and 20, this is again one of the pictures of the defining pictures of the pandemia. This picture is by Emilio uh, Morenati from, and published in CNN. Um, again, one of the, the son or children also were affected. And this is a, a, a gra graduation time in Japan where they utilize these robots to put the faces over kids. Uh, during the to be able to participate during the graduation time, and this is a kid in Malaysia. This is a nurse adjusting a face shield of a newborn baby at the hospital, so in Thailand, uh, in the Prakan province, in April 2020, as uh, uh, trying to to protect the, the the child against COVID-19. In any case, this is just to. Uh, give us some some thoughts and some uh, also uh, ideas, and the most important thing is how we can prepare for the next uh, play for the next next pandemic. Of of course we we don't want that, but also uh, uh, we need to to be uh, prepared to try to uh, understand what happened uh, to try to know uh, what happened when the uh, all pandemias, what happened during the COVID pandemia, and also how we can get more prepared uh, for the for the future. In any case, I want to conclude uh, with an invitation for.
for our uh, 16th World Intensive Care Critical Care Congress that is going to be held the 20 to, to from the 26th to the 30th of August in uh, Istanbul, uh, Turkey. With that, I want to um, thank you for your attention and hopefully you enjoy the rest of this uh, important event, the critical long.